Hello and welcome to Let's Talk Clean Air, where we find out more about how clean air can affect the quality process for you and the workplace. I'm your host, Jacob Stewart, and in this episode, we're going to be discussing dust collection in the packaging industry. With me today is Canfield APC's Chris Fluharty. How are you doing today, Chris? I'm doing well, Jacob. Thanks for asking. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. So first off, can you tell me a little bit more just about yourself and what you do here at Canfield? Sure, I'd be happy to do that. I've been in the filtration business since 1998, so about 24 years now. Uh, I joined the Canfill team in February of 2011, so I've been here with Canfill for right about 11 years. I've been the Northeast Regional Manager here since 2015, and that territory has expanded southward the last couple of years to now include the entire East Coast. Currently, I'm managing 19 states, I believe was my last count for Campville APC and I'm from Maine all the way through Florida. All right, well we're we're glad to have you here on the episode with us today. So to start things off, can you explain what the packaging industry is to those who might not know and what kind of products are produced in this industry as well as just the general importance of this industry? Yeah, well first I would define the packaging industry as the business sector involved with the design and production of packaging products so they can basically be safely and securely shipped and also for the storage of products so the products within this industry that are most prevalent with what we do would be paperboard that would be used to form cardboard boxes which has seen tremendous growth with more and more americans shopping online plastic containers of all sorts bottles containers and metal cans that are used in the food and beverage industry could be soup cans could be soda cans any type of aluminum containers but to really simplify it you could say that any product you see on a shelf in a store is in a package that was manufactured specifically for that product Anytime you see a UPS, FedEx, or Amazon truck out making deliveries, they're filled with boxes manufactured by the packaging industry. Overall, Jacob, the packaging industry is valued at over $180 billion in the U.S., and it's expected to grow at a rate of just under 4% annually over the next five years, and and frankly, probably beyond that. So it sounds like there's just a lot going on within this industry more than maybe some people might originally think. So what type of processes create dust within that industry? That's a good question. There's many processes in the paperboard manufacturing that generate dust and scrap, uh, including trim machines, die cut presses, shredders, balers, and vacuum feed conveyors. But beyond being a housekeeping nuisance, the dust is combustible. And that's a major factor on why a lot of these facilities use industrial dust collectors. Can manufacturing is quite a bit different from paperboard manufacturing, and it creates both dust and mist. Uh, The process starts with a large roll of aluminum, and it's fed through punch presses, and then a process of drawing and ironing to form a can. There's a trimming process, and, and then it's finished off by cleaning and decorating the cans and then creating the lid. That manufacturing process is very unique, and it requires both dust collectors and mist collectors uh, in order to ensure a clean, safe manufacturing environment. And then plastic bottle manufacturing or any plastic container manufacturing in the packaging industry typically starts with thousands of tiny plastic pellets. Those pellets are typically fed into hoppers that travel into a machine where they're melted down and injected into molds that would shape the plastic into bottles or different containers. And they also use, in some cases, an extrusion process to shape the bottles. The dust is typically generated in the plastic manufacturing from the handling and transporting of the raw plastic pellets. And then there's also some finishing and trimming and shaping the bottles at the end of the extrusion process that creates dust. What are some of the dangers that are associated with dust in the packaging industry? Uh, The biggest threats of dust in this industry are really broken down into two categories, and it's occupational exposure and combustible dust explosions. 
the dust in the packaging industry may not seem as dangerous to our health as some dust in other industries, maybe such as like the pharmaceutical industry, where they may be dealing with uh, toxic chemicals or something that, you know, you have to take containment into account. But the fact is that the dust from the packaging industry still can contain particulate that's toxic when swallowed or inhaled. The dust can cause different forms of dermatitis or allergic reactions. The dust particles could also become embedded in the lungs and cause respiratory problems like asthma, could be lung cancer, could be any form of some sort of respiratory problem. But from a combustible standpoint, the buildup of these dust can be the fuel for fires and explosions in facilities and within a dust collection system itself. Would you say that this industry is more prone to flammability than some others? I wouldn't say that this industry is more prone to uh, flammability, probably less so than others. But take the metalworking industry, for example. The metalworking industry utilizes a lot of hot work in the manufacturing process. And when I say hot work, I'm talking about like welding and plasma cutting, just to name a couple. These manufacturing processes could be a source of the ignition or the cause of the fire explosion. With the paperboard industry, for example, it's it's uncommon to see a spark or ignition source in the manufacturing process unless you were to have a piece of equipment were to fail or something you know pretty untypical would have to occur. What are some ways to be proactive with flammable and explosive dust? Well, before ever handling combustible dust, the first thing I would recommend would be for companies to do some research in order to protect their workers. I would encourage them to familiarize themselves with NFPA 652. 652 is the standard on the fundamentals of combustible dust, and it was designed to provide the general requirements for the management of combustible dust hazards. And it also directs people to specific standards that are applicable to the process. I don't wanna go into too much detail, Jacob, because this topic alone could support its own series of podcasts, but this is a starting point and it explains how to identify and mitigate those hazards. It goes through testing your dust to determine the combustibility, developing a dust hazard analysis and documenting everything related to your process. Outside of the handling of the combustible dust, companies should probably be implementing comprehensive housekeeping processes that minimizes or, you know, it's hard to eliminate, but you definitely want to minimize the buildup of combustible dust on any surfaces within your facilities. Right. And we've done an episode on this in the past, but for those who don't know, could you explain a little bit more about what a dust hazard analysis is and how often is a dust hazard analysis necessary in this industry? Uh, A DHA is often how we refer to it, you know, just an acronym for dust hazard analysis is uh, basically the identification and evaluation of the process or areas within a facility where fire, flash fire, and explosion hazards exist. It includes documenting how those hazards are being managed, and each part of a facility or process is considered for a potential deflagration hazard. A DHA should typically classify uh, locations in a facility into three categories. It's either not a hazard, might be a hazard, or is a deflagration hazard. And that'll help the owner or the manager of a facility prioritize management of the hazards. It also will identify where more information is needed before more definitive determination could be made. And that DHA needs to be updated every five years is what they say in 652 or every time a process changes. Okay, so we, we've talked a lot about the different risks that come from dust within this industry. Uh, what are some of the health risks that pop up, and how do these risks differ from some of the other industries where dust collection is prominent? Well, every dust is different in terms of the health risks that they pose. Uh, the dust in the packaging industry, which would include paper, plastic, and metals, uh, can contain particulate that's toxic when ingested. Uh, It can cause, you know, skin reactions, dermatitis, different allergic reactions. 
And I also believe I mentioned that, it, you know, it can become embedded in the lungs and cause different respiratory issues. But the truth is that we don't know what we don't know. And studies continue to expose more and more of the dangers of breathing in contaminated air and the negative effects they have on our health. On average, humans consume two quarts of water per day, and we inhale approximately 15,000 quarts of air. And when you start to think about the sheer volume of air that you breathe on a daily basis, it makes you want to ensure that it's as clean as possible, regardless of the risk of fire or explosion. In your opinion, what can be done to, to keep the dust under control in a facility like that? The best thing to do is to have a dust collection expert that you trust, that you know, come to your facility to evaluate your processes and either review an existing system that you have to ensure that it's operating properly and that it's compliant or to design a comprehensive system that not only captures the dust as it's generated, but provides you with a complete system that's going to protect your workers, your facility, and comply with the regulations. And so this is something we've touched on a little bit already, but in what other ways does the dust collection process in this industry differ from others? And if it does at all? Well, it, it does. And that's the crazy thing about dust and dust collection is two facilities that are doing the same things or will have a different layout and different challenges. But I'd say the biggest difference with dust collection in this industry is the sheer volume of dust that's generated. Most of these packaging facilities are operating 24 hours a day and at a breakneck speed and volume. These systems are usually pretty large, so planning how to handle the discharge dust that we've already captured as typically a more in-depth process. Uh, it often involves screw conveyors and briquetters and other methods to package and recycle the captured dust. So a term that I've heard a lot is bridging. What is that and why is it important to select a dust collector design that prevents something like that? Bridging is basically when dust builds up on itself. Um, you think of like a bird's nest that's got material and different sizes of leaves and branches that build like a ball of material. And it's kind of similar to bridging. You know, the dust builds up on itself and it prevents it from flowing down through the hopper and uh, ultimately from dropping out of the collector, which is our goal in a dust collector is not only capture the dust, but get it out of the dust collector because it's a it's typically a flammable material uh, and combustible. And, you know, a modern dust collector like the Gold Series X-Flow uses some specially designed cross-flow inlet with filter cartridges that are positioned vertically as opposed to horizontally. So they're hanging, which allows the dust to, allows gravity to do its job for for lack of a better way of putting it. And these design features help stop paper fibers from bridging, especially in between the filters and in processes we come across like book binding and printing and corrugated box board manufacturing. It really helps reduce the bridging effect. And we also, in some extreme cases where you've got a large mixture of different size particulate, when you get a mixture of different size particulate, that lends itself to bridging. So if you do run into a situation where you're going to have long strands and, and small fines, uh, you might want to consider having like nylon over bags that can be installed on the outside of the cartridges. And that will also aid in preventing bridging between the filters. Okay, so to kind of build off that, how often would you say that maintenance is required for a dust collector? That's a question I probably get the most. And to be honest, it depends on a number of things, such as like how often is the dust collector going to be operating? How much dust is the dust collector going to be handling? And something that would seem to be common sense is how many components are a part of this dust collection system. And the most common items, though, to answer your question, that require regular maintenance are monitoring the levels of the collection drums or the containers underneath the hoppers and ensuring those are emptied regularly. And that will prevent the material from 
building up and backflowing into the collector, which is a danger not only to shorten your filter life and some maintenance issues, but that paper and that material is a fuel if there's a fire. So we want to get it out of there. Also monitoring the filter loading by regularly checking and logging differential pressures. Typically, you'll have to have quarterly inspections of your explosion protection devices to ensure they're functioning properly. I think that reduces over time, but you get an idea to, so if you have like inlet isolation valves, you want to monitor the wear on those blades and uh, you want to make sure if you have explosion vents that they're not ruptured and that they're intact and, and that everything in that system is going to operate. However, the amount of maintenance needed can be drastically reduced simply by selecting the right dust collection system. I can't tell you how many times I see my competitors that will undersize a dust collector to to make the price lower to, I guess, to ultimately win the purchase order. But, you know, doing that leads to frequent filter change outs and it creates a much higher cost of ownership for the end user. I mean, the fans operating at full speed because the filters are under extreme loading, which requires more energy. And I guess that, you know, the point is that a properly designed dust collection system will require much less maintenance and consume less energy, but it's a variable to really try to predict how much maintenance it's going to require. So within the packaging industry, we have things like paper and plastic and metal. How would you say that dust collection differs between those different subsections of the packaging industry? I can tell you I've had much more experience throughout my career in the paper industry than the can or the plastic bottle manufacturing industries. But I can tell you that they are all quite a bit different and unique in their own ways. The can manufacturing, like I said earlier, it creates both dust and mist. There's not a one system to capture all the air contaminants in a can manufacturing facility. You know, you have these large rolls of aluminum that will feed through punch presses and then a process of drawing and ironing to form the can. That process requires some release agents and lubricants, and that creates a mist. So that would require mist collectors to capture those mists and remove those from the air. And then you run into trimming process and a finishing area where they're cleaning and decorating the cans. And those are typically will create a dust that you can capture with a dust collector. And it's it's very unique. And like I said, it requires both dry dust collectors and mist collectors if you're going to ensure a clean, safe manufacturing environment. And then uh, the plastic container manufacturing, again, that starts with, you know, they bring in pallets of boxes of tiny plastic pellets. And you've got, you know, millions of these plastic pellets that they typically will put vacuum hoses into and just vacuum feed them into huge hoppers. And then those hoppers will direct all those little pellets into machines where they're melted down. And then that that melted plastic material will be injected into molds and shape the plastic into containers or bottles, or they'll utilize an extrusion process where they pull it into forms. And the dust is typically generated from the handling of those raw plastic pellets. Anytime you're moving a bunch of small uh, material, it's going to generate some dust. And then at the end of the process, if they're they're doing some final cleaning and trimming of the process, that'll create dust as well. We talk a lot about the benefit of cartridge filters on this show. Uh, can you explain why a cartridge filter is more beneficial than something like, say, a bag filter? First of all, cartridge filters have a much higher efficiency than bag filters. And there are applications out there that bags are better fit than cartridges. In this industry, that's not one of those. Uh, higher efficiency captures probably preferred here. But our standard filter cartridges are rated at over 99% at half a micron and larger. So we're capturing nearly all of the fine particulate that would get airborne. And what that means is we can meet emissions requirements without any additional downstream filtration. And the standards typically allowed in the corrugated paper industry is a five milligram per cubic meter exposure to employees over an eight hour time-weighted period. 
And then if you're pumping the air outdoors, typically the EPA is going to limit you to 0.002 grains per cubic foot of air discharged. Bags won't meet those standards without additional filtration downstream. The average for a bag filter, and they make different medias, the same as we do cartridges, but we're talking averages here, and we don't use high-grade filter media typically. We, we have some you know, coated and different types of medias, but our, I'm talking about our base average media at 99%, a half a micron, and the average bag is going to be around 40 milligrams per cubic meter. And so cartridge style collectors like the Gold Series X Flow consistently will achieve levels below that five milligram per cubic meter threshold that OSHA sets without any additional filtration. And in addition to that, one of our filter cartridges is equivalent to roughly eight to 10 bags. And that will lead you to a smaller dust collector. It will lead you to a less expensive installation because of the collector being smaller. And it also is going to create an environment where you have a much easier filter change out that takes less time and ultimately lends itself to less downtime for the production process. What advice would you give somebody who's trying to select the right filter cartridge for their process? I would tell them to work with a company that can provide hard evidence to support their media recommendation. And what I mean by hard evidence, I know at Camphill, we have a lab where we receive dust samples every day. And we have, if you're ever to come visit our facility, and we're in the process of building a new facility now, so that won't be possible until the end of summer this year. But we receive dust samples every day that our lab technicians perform physical properties testing on, and that ensures the proper media is selected. They're breaking down the size of the particulate. They're breaking down whether or not it's abrasive or adhesive or cohesive. They'll generate a detailed report for our customers that not only recommends the best media to use, but it also is recommending what air to cloth ratio to use with that media. It'll recommend minimum conveying velocities within the duct. And last but not least, it's also going to provide you with hopper angles recommended to ensure that the dust doesn't bridge, the dust doesn't build up and it's evacuated out of the dust collector. So, you know, you see a low maintenance dust collection system that doesn't interfere with your production is much more than just selecting the right filter media, so to speak. Okay, and so to kind of close things off, how would you say the current pandemic has affected this industry specifically? Oh, Jacob, uh, you know the pandemic has affected the entire world, and I'm sure you know the saying that every cloud has a silver lining. And I'm not going to try and minimize the amount of pain and loss of life that this pandemic's caused for not only Americans, but also people around the world. It's truly rattled the world and continues to create havoc with all the new variants that we continue to see surface. However, it has led to people congregating less and increased shopping online. An increase of online shopping leads to an increased demand of all types of packaging to transport the products. So this is a trend I don't see changing and in fact only becoming more prevalent the change in behavior where more and more people are not going to big box stores or to shopping malls, but rather shopping online, I believe will continue to create a growing demand for corrugated boxes and all types of packaging for years to come. All right. Well, thank you again, Chris, for stopping by. If you'd like to find out more about this and other topics, simply follow the links in the show notes, which you'll find in the description of this podcast. They include links, contact details, and anything else you might need to get more information. This podcast was produced by Camphill, the world leader in the production and development of air filters and clean air solutions. You can find out more at camphill.com. Be sure to join us for our next episode and be sure to subscribe to get notifications for future episodes. Until then, I'm your host, Jacob Stewart, and this has been Let's Talk Clean Air. Thank you for listening.